Okay. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm uh, Manuel Schilling. Um, and uh, last year I started uh, to, I had the idea of uh, participating a bit in the development of the Linux kernel. Um, and I got, a lot, got quite a lot of knowledge how it works. And so I decided I'd give a presentation to share this with everyone. Um, a quick show of hands. Uh, who has, who's using Linux? Okay. <laughs> who is, uh, who has ever compiled their own kernel? Okay. Good. And has anybody already uh, contributed to the kernel? One. Okay. Great. <laughs> Good. Um, okay. So, um, in, um, about, what is it now? Uh, 15, no, 25 years ago, uh, actually in the year 1991, uh, uh, Linux kernel, uh, Linus <laughs> uh wrote this email uh, to a news group announcing his project. Um, and he said it would be just a small project, just a hobby, nothing big and professional, and actually now uh, in the year 2015, it's now probably one of the most important software projects uh, on the planet. And uh, because it's very, actually it runs everywhere and on millions of computers. Um, and although he said that back then it's just a hobby, nowadays the contributors look like this. This is the list of the contributors uh, in the 314 kernel. And as you can see, the most uh, number one is Intel, you see Red Hat, uh, you see a lot of big companies. You don't see Canonical here somehow. <laughs> they don't contribute to the kernel, uh, at least back then. Um, and, but you also see on the second rank, um, there are developers without affiliation. And the fourth rank are developers uh, which either Greg Rowe Hartman couldn't find out who, uh, who the real developer really is, to which company he belongs, or uh, the company said that they don't, they don't want to publish that they contribute to the Linux kernel. But um, as you can see, the second most, and maybe even if you, if you include the fourth rank, um, there is still a big amount of, um, of hobbyists um, contributing to, no, to the Linux kernel. And although it's uh, quite professional now, we need uh, for the development, uh, there are new developers needed. And uh, yeah, of course, if they, if they learn before they go to a company how to contribute to the Linux kernel, it's always a plus. Um, so why on earth should you start uh, kernel hacking? Uh, of course, if you have a bug in the kernel on, and you find this on your computer, uh, you probably want to fix it. Um, and so this would could be one motivation. Another simple motivation is just that uh, that you want to be that you 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 want to show the world that you can do this and. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's a nice thing if you can say that you contributed to the Linux kernel, although if, even if you just contributed to a few patches. Um, and maybe your motivation is just to uh, play tricks on your colleagues. There is, for example, a Linux kernel module uh, called kernel role. And uh, if you install this on your computer, everybody uh, who opens an MP3 on the computer uh, will get this famous song of Rick Astley. Um, so maybe this is also your motivation. But um, uh, also what ha will happen if you become a contributor to the Linux kernel and uh, write a lot of patches, um, the industry will, uh, will notice that. And if you show that you can do a good work, um, you, yeah, they will get in touch with you. And maybe if you want to get a job, uh, then uh, this is yeah this is one way to do this. Um, 
And on the other hand, if you contribute to the Linux kernel, you um, help the whole community on the, on the planet uh, who use the, the software. And uh, it's also nice to know that your software will run on a lot of big machines in all the data centers around the planet and will also affect everyone in their everyday life. Um, so um, what uh, actually do you require to contribute, contribute to the Linux kernel? Well, um, there are mainly two main skills you would need. One, of course, is knowing Git, knowing uh, this uh, version control system, how to, how to deal with this, how to create commits, how, could, how to create patches. Um, this is mandatory, and uh, there is an optional uh, required skill, skill, which is the C programming language. And actually, you don't have to know C to contribute to the kernel. There are also people who uh, just fix spelling errors or fix the documentation and stuff like that. So uh, you don't have to be an advanced C developer to contribute patches to the kernel. Um, but usually when you, uh, yeah, when you want to contribute to the Linux kernel, it's always a big question is, what do you want to do? Uh, so you have to find out what should be your task uh, when, you, when you start developing. Because usually, I mean, um, as I mentioned before, maybe you see that a part of the kernel is really bad documented and the developer didn't really spend a lot of time uh, showing how, how a certain module works. So maybe uh, one, one option is to, uh, when you see that the part is badly documented and you had a hard time to find out how it really works, you can contribute to the documentation and help everyone who also uh, uses the same part of the kernel. Um, or maybe you have a new gadget and uh, it doesn't really work. Um, Sometimes this is really simple. Sometimes the kernel actually would already knows how to, how to deal with a certain device. For example, uh, if you have some USB gadget and the latest generation, there is already the driver, but the driver doesn't know that it also supports this thing. So there are easy patches uh, that you can contribute to the Linux kernel just by telling the Linux kernel, yeah, this driver actually also works for the gadget with this USB ID. Um, or as I said before, maybe uh, you have a kernel crash and you you want to find uh, you you found out want to find out how it how it, uh, yeah what the actual bug is and uh, fix it. Um, and uh, another opportunity also to uh, to get better skills in C programming is just by reading the code, to do a code review. And uh, the quality of the Linux kernel is actually pretty good. Um, so you learn new stuff when you read it, but uh, then sometimes you find bugs when you read it, and then you can, you can fix, uh, fix this. But other parts of the Linux kernel are not so uh, well written, and when you read this stuff, you already notice that there are parts that can be re refactored or parts that can be merged. Um, so refactoring the code is also a possibility. Um, and uh, yeah, let's say you already found your task and uh, and. I don't know if you you uh, you you, you uh, want to create uh, a patch for the kernel, then um, the big question is how to submit the patch. The general idea is this: first, you clone the kernel source, then you do your commit, uh, you, you, you change the code, um, you create commits, and depending on how complex uh, the stuff is that you are doing. You uh, you must repeat the step. You create several commits. Sometimes just one commit. Uh, in the end, you run two scripts. One is checking your patch, and the other one is uh, determining how uh, which maintainers are responsible for the code. Um, 
Okay, the first step is cloning the source. Um, there is, uh, Linus Torvalds has a Git repository on GitHub, but um, this is not the right source for developing the Linux kernel. And sending patches to Linus Torvalds uh, GitHub repository via pull request won't be accepted. <laughs> um, and uh, there is the kernel.org um, domain, and there also Linux has its own repository. But when you develop patches, it should be against the Linux next uh, repository, which is uh, uh, maintained by Greg Crow Hartman. So this is the very long ID uh, URL. And it's about 1.7 gigabytes uh, that you have to download, but then you have the whole uh, history of the Linux kernel back to version, I don't know, 0 0.1 or something like that. So quite a lot of uh, source code and history. And what you will get is a structure like this. Uh, these are just the directories in the uh, main, um, main directory. And uh, yeah, you can see that there are st there is stuff uh, like here. Oh, you don't see the cursor. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, like directories with architecture dependent stuff. Uh, this is probably not so important for uh, when you start developing stuff. Uh, the no. um, Block device drivers are in this directory, cryptographic uh, functions. This is a very nice directory, the documentation. There is a lot of stuff explained, even uh, what you wouldn't expect, how to set up. I think there's also a, 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 a how to for setting up your email client, client to s uh, send patches and stuff like that. Um, this is one of the largest directories, the drivers. These are um, the device drivers, so for all the USB stuff, PCI stuff, uh, and uh, all the things, there are uh, there are the drivers in this directory. Uh, the file system um, logic is described here. And memory manager management. This net directory is not for the for the for the for the uh, drivers for network device cards, but it's more lo the logic. For example, the implementation of TCP is in there, um, and uh, yeah, sound system stuff like that. Um, and when you search for in, in this in this uh, directory for to do files, you won't find in this case uh, 64. Maybe this is a little bit older. This uh, this, this number, and uh, so a lot of uh, developers create to-do files and uh, write down what they want to do and what they actually don't want to do and what other people uh, to do. So if you're looking for a task uh, for the kernel programming, you can look into the to-do files, and there are often quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of uh, nice tasks to start with uh, when you develop develop stuff. And um, yeah, when you there is this nice coding style file, and uh, just a summary for that, you, they use tap indentions. Uh, the line wrap is about eighty characters. Um, I say about eighty characters because nowadays it's not so the, the screens are large enough uh, to to show more than eighty characters and. Uh, sometimes it doesn't make sense to break uh, just at 80 characters, uh, just to just, just to uh, be compliant to the coast coding style. Uh, so you can get up to I don't know 90 or whatever. But if you have more characters in one line, there's probably something wrong with your code, and you're trying to express too much in one single line, and you should break it, should break the line. Um, but uh, Yes. Um, another advice is uh, writing clean code. There was a nice talk yesterday by 
uh, Laura Mitchell, I think, about how to create patches and what you uh, have to remember when you write patches for open source projects. Um, I would recommend to, to watch this video again. Um, but in general, you keep, you should keep in mind that they, these people don't want any junk in their, uh, in their source code. And, uh, these people have to understand what you are doing and why you are doing it and, um, why they should accept your patch. So you, you should really try to, to write good code. And, uh, if you do larger commits, uh, split your stuff into several, um, if you do larger, uh, larger patches, you should split your stuff in, 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 into individual uh, commits to let the people see how, uh, how your way of thought was. And uh, you should also, if you provide new code, you should, uh, the code should, be, uh, should not create compiler warnings because they are really annoying. And uh, yeah. And some, sometimes the compiler warning really is a warning. It's just, just a notice and you should really fix what the compiler warning says. says. And um, you should, I, I think it's a bad idea to just grab the Linux kernel, look for which, which part of the code generates uh, compiler warnings and just fix the compiler warnings because just fixing the compiler warning um, uh, is actually, it's sometimes pretty easy. You just have to cast, cast, I don't know, an integer into integer with 46 bits or something like that. But, um, when you're not in, you don't know the details of the code, you actually don't know why the compiler warning actually arises. So I would, uh, recommend not to say, hey, I, at first, my, at first task, I choose uh, fixing compiler warnings because it can be dangerous. Um, and um, when you create patches, it can be, I would recommend to just create very simple patches in the beginning, just to get to know the workflow, to find out how it works. Um, so uh, there was a project called the Kernel Genitus. Uh, they still have a website, but it's, I think it's from 19, no, 2008 and not changed since. Um, and they list some, some tasks that, uh, should be done. And, uh, at the beginning, I chose the task to, um, to modify a time comparison. So this Jiffy's is, uh, the time counter in the Linux kernel. And, uh, when you have this raw comparisons with the Jiffy's variable, you can get arithmetic errors, which, uh, was uh, so it was to proposed uh, that all these, all these, uh, all these comparisons should be modified to use this function, which is safe against these kind of errors. And the first thing I did was just fixing some occurrences of this stuff. And uh, after a while, a few people or some people um, noticed that I sent a lot of patches. And uh, then they sent me an email and sent me a big regular expression and told me, yeah, here you can use this regular expression to pass the whole Linux source code and fix all, the, all of this stuff. And so they really notice when you, when you contribute stuff like that. Um, or this is, this is actually a quite a nice example also. Uh, it's just a very tiny change in the, in the, um, source code, um, but it makes sense. It's, I mean, for the maintainer, if the maintainer gets this patch, he can immediately see, okay, what is, what, what should this be? And actually, when you just see this modification, this N to an L, it's, uh, not, it's not clear why it's, why, why you should include this change. So, uh, you should always take care when you create, uh, commit messages, which is, in this case, up here, that you really, in the first line of the commit message, um, explain what you're doing and more, not exactly what you're doing, but why you're doing it. So uh, the first line should, 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 should include the information, why is this change important? Why should the maintainer include your patch 
um, to uh, to the source. And then you have a free line and a uh, longer text describing this stuff. Sometimes you don't need it. Sometimes it's really important that you include it because uh, otherwise nobody will get why, what you're trying to do with, it, with your uh, bonification. Um, another thing about commis commit messages is that you start the commit messages with usually with the module that you're, you're modifying. So this is the file that you modified, and uh, you know this directory, and you usually include it there. So when you look at the whole history, the whole git log, you can easily see which part of the Linux kernel was changed by which commit. And the third thing about um, commit messages is uh, the path of blame, it's called. Uh, this signed off by uh, line. So when you are, you are creating a, <coughs> uh, a patch, you must always include in your, um, in your commit a line which is saying signed off by and then your name and your email address. Um, and uh, because any modification in the kernel, um, any person who changes uh, a bit in the kernel or, or touches a bit in the kernel um, is, is, is registered by such a signed off by line. Um, there is also tested by, I think, and stuff like that. So, um, and if you send this stuff to an email, uh, e email list and other people uh, have tested it or have checked your code, they will send you an email saying signed off by blah, 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 somebody else. Uh, and you can include it in your commit message to show other people that these other people also uh, agree, agree with your code. Um, and actually, nowadays, uh, especially in software development, there is a lot of stuff like, like uh, unit testing and stuff like that. Um, this is not so much done in the, in the Linux kernel. It's sometimes even possible that you cr create a patch and just check if it, co if it compiles, and then send it to, to the maintainer to include it in the, in the source uh, code. Because um, sometimes you modify code that you don't have, uh, for, for hardware that you don't have. And uh, so it's not possible for you to test it. But um, as long as you really uh, are sure that your patch does not create an error, it's fine not really to run the code just to to patch, uh, ju just to compile the code. This, of course, this is not true for big changes. Uh, I, for big changes, it's really hard uh, to to assume that uh, the code is fine without really running it. But uh, for one-liners, one-line modification, this is uh, not a problem. Um, once you've created your patch. You can run the check patch script against it. And the check patch script, um, a while ago, I, I, yeah, this is one of the, of the, one, one of my first patches, these uh, modifications with the comparison of, of GIFs. And, uh, yeah, I don't know, I was used to the, to my own coding style, so, where is it? Yeah. Uh, th so the script, one of the things that the script does is checking the coding style, and as you can see here, there's a space missing. Uh, meanwhile, I already changed my personal coding style to match with the kernel coding style, so uh, it tells you these, these, these. Uh, it tells you these uh, simple syntax uh, or coding style errors, but it also uh, checks more complex stuff like deprecated functions. Uh, if you if they are used, they give it gives a warning and tells you, you know, this is uh, deprecated. You should use another function. And uh, what also sometimes happens is yeah, that you missed, uh, you forgot to include the signed off line in your uh, commit message, and it also checks stuff like that. Um, and let's assume you have created your patch. 
and you maybe even tested it for your hardware if you have the, the, this hardware and you ran the check patch script and everything is fine. Then, especially in the very beginning, I would say, okay, um, go away from your co computer, go outside, have a coffee, uh, go for a walk or whatever, and then come back and have a look at your code again and check if it's really good, if there is no, if it's, if you can even refactor it to make it a little, little bit better, uh, to make it's easier for the maintainer to see how this patch works. And if everything is fine with the, with your patch, you can run the get maintainer patch, so, uh, get maintainer script against your patch. And what would this um, will do? It will check all the files that are touched by your, ta by your, by your patch and uh, find out who is the maintainer of this file and will print this list. For the ISDN stuff, uh, stack here, um, there is quite a low number of, of, of uh, maintainers. Um, so it's just these uh, Carson and David here. And um, if you touch the, 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 I don't know, the network stack, for example, the, you will get a, quite a long list. Um, what I do then is I just include the main, uh, the five most important people and send them the, the, the email. Um, but you should always include the mailing list, which is here, the mailing list for the network uh, devices and the uh, complete Linux kernel mailing, mailing list. So this last mailing list is really huge. There are hundreds of patches going, uh, going there every day and uh, I wouldn't recommend to su subscribe to this list. <laughs> Just look at the archives. <laughs> um, but you send out this uh, this patch then um, to the maintainers, and there is actually a special function for that. So you don't you do the pull request or something like that. That's not how it, how it works for the Linux kernel. Um, you can configure, and I think you should configure um, Git to do this for you, because uh, what from what I heard, there are a lot of problems with email programs. They introduced uh, line breaks somewhere, or uh, yes, yeah, scramble uh, with the with the patch, and so it, yeah, the people won't get the right patch, uh, the correct patch. Uh, so setting up the uh, Git for that, there are patches on this, uh, uh, how tos for this online. This uh, is easy. You just have to tell the SMTP server and the password and the username. And you send the patch, um, and then you wait a bit, and depending on how many people are interested in, in, in this part of the Linux kernel, you will get emails uh, either quick, quite quickly or not so quickly. <laughs> um, and yeah, if you if you do if you start with one line, and it's really. Uh, uh, it's quite likely that your patch will be accepted. And if you do bigger modifications, it's quite likely that they come back to you and say, ah, okay, I don't, I don't like this part. Why do you do this? Uh, maybe some people even say, okay, that's total crap what, you, what you're doing. <laughs> um, but uh, if you start with very simple patches, it's, it's quite likely that they are accepted uh, immediately. Um, and uh, okay, there is. Uh, it doesn't only help you when you uh, for uh, it, even if you if you don't uh, want to become a Linux kernel contributor, um, it does really help you if you do just you do it just once or twice per fun because you learn how the kernel development works. And uh, a while ago at work, I had this big kernel crash. Uh, frequently, and uh, I decided, okay, I must find out how to fix it. And it was in some caching function of the Linux kernel. And uh, when you learn to, to to create patches for the Linux kernel, you learn what information that you should provide to the maintainers to to help them uh, to fix f fix stuff. And so I got in touch with the maintainer. So I used this get maintainer script to find out who is responsible for 
this file. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, he, held, he was uh, David Howells at Red Hat, and he was really helpful. Um, so we fixed it, this, this stuff within one week. And uh, as you probably know, there are only two things in computer two hard things in computer science. One is cache invalidation, the other one is naming things. And here it was cache invalidation. <laughs> and uh, something else. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I, this was one of my patches. That, so I, I, I reviewed some code. Uh, I can't really, ah, yeah, in the DNS resolver. Uh, so I just read the code, and I saw something is odd there. Um, and I found out that there's a off by one error right here. And uh, so I created a patch. I don't know, it wasn't really my best day because actually the patch that I created, there's a bug included there. Can anybody spot the bug? <laughs> so I, I fixed the off by one error here and then I reintroduced it right here. <laughs> so this was a little bit embarrassing to, to be honest. Um, and I sent this mail, to, uh, to this patch to the uh, to some mailing list, and I, within a few minutes, I got an email saying "off by one error." So <laughs> they spotted it immediately. Um, so of course, this is embarrassing, and uh, I've heard from a lot of people that they are actually afraid to contribute to the Linux kernel because uh, in the press there is. A lot of bad news, and uh, sometimes there are people who are not so nice and 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 uh, shout at you. And uh, uh, there also there is also community in the within the, the Linux kernel community who don't want to want so harsh discussions. Uh, what I always think when I get an email like that: uh, don't feed the trolls. Get away from the keyboard, come back ha half an hour later and try to see what is the real uh, criticism, what is um, actually uh, wrong with your, your, your patch and how can I fix it. And uh, yeah, you shouldn't really, uh, you shouldn't really shout back because this is leading nowhere. Um, and, uh, yeah, there is, uh, first of all, there, there's a, this great source uh, of information in the documentation folder, but um, there is also the Kernel Newbies website. They have uh, great information about uh, the developing, um, developing the Linux kernel, and they have this IRC channel, and they are really, there are really nice people. There are, I don't know, hundreds of people and nobody's talking and uh, when you send uh, when, when you go there you can ask questions and they are very helpful and uh, yeah when you have questions about code you can ask there and sometimes also if uh, if you yeah if, if it's not directly about the code if you are asking uh, Hey, I want to modify this part. Uh, there is a dependency on another part of the Linux kernel. How should I, uh, how should I start doing this? And uh, they are really nice and helpful there. Um, and there is maybe some of you know this. Uh, there's this uh, Linux Insight uh, Git book. This is quite a nice source. For example, um, there's a description of what are the first steps that the Linux kernel does to initialize hardware and how does it do, I don't know, uh, memory management and stuff like that. So this is a nice source to find out how stuff uh, works in the Linux kernel. And uh, yeah, I think that's already it. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Yeah, is there any way to, uh, uh, I mean, there is a way to, uh, uh, like, you know, how to submit the patches anonymously. Anonymously? Yeah, more uh, or less. <laughs> it doesn't need to be uh, secure. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think so. 
because they always have the password blamed. You, you agree? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I have to repeat it for the, for the, for the video again. Uh, so there's no way to, to submit uh, real patches anonymously, but I mean, you can create, actually, you could create a fake identity or fake, create a fake email address and send, send stuff like that. Um, but uh, I don't know if it's uh, really, uh, so sometimes uh, in the, back to the statistics, there are unknowns because, um, you couldn't really find out from the email address uh, where this, if this person uh, is a, is a, is a uh, professional uh, contributor or not. But in general, uh, no, it's not possible to do this. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I've, oh, why would you do? <laughs> ah, so, ah, so, okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I usually uh, just create new branches, yeah. And there I create a new patch, and uh, yes, then I send the stuff out. And uh, I try to manage the, 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 the communication about the patches in my email program, uh, in different subfolders to, to keep track what patches are accepted and which one are not. And uh, usually I do this. But yeah, from the code side, uh, just create new branches and because, I mean, the, the, this kernel is also quite big, so if you uh, c c uh, copy the whole, the whole Git repository, uh, yeah, you will get a lot of disk space wasted. <laughs> Uh, the question was, why, uh, how do you do it with big uh, refactoring, uh, not to get into a conflict with other people? Uh, this is actually quite a problem, yes. Uh, so um, you have to try to create good code and uh, so that the maintainer really can understand your code quite quickly and to hope that you, 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 your um, Stuff is included uh, quickly in the in the kernel before somebody else, every else changes it. But I think um, there are also I mean there are also um, other repositories for uh, I think that for example the network guys have their own repository and uh, so their changes don't interfere with other stuff. And uh, depending on the part that you change, uh, there might be a different repository that you uh, should. Uh, no, I mean you can send it. I mean in this mailing list there are uh, uh, there are hundreds of emails anyway. So if you announce this, this uh, won't uh, bother probably bother anyone. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean if you, I don't know how big your changes should. Uh, I mean you should also try to to include just uh, small changes. And if you create big modifications, it's less likely that they are accepted because they destroy everything and I, I remember the story that once some guy, I mean years ago, some guy changed a big part of the network stack and uh, then a week after his email address, uh, there was a problem with the stuff and his email address uh, was deactivated so the account was deactivated and the person was gone and uh, they had to deal with this. So I, I, the smaller your patch is, the more likely it is that it's accepted. Um, and uh, I also gave this presentation somewhere else, and there somebody came to me after the talk and told me that he created the whole bus uh, uh, implementation of a bus um, of a new bus that uh, Linux write, 
Linux, Linux right now does not support. And he told me that he was just afraid to send it to the Linux kernel uh, mailing list because he heard that uh, from the press that that there is always such a harsh discussion and uh, I think uh, this is really not necessary and he shouldn't really have a big um, there shouldn't be a big barrier to con contribute to the Linux kernel and uh, I think the kernel newbies is a nice uh, source for for help with that. Um, there is a unit testing framework, I think, right now in the uh, part, I don't know in which directory, um, but actually, to be honest, I don't use it. <laughs> um, nobody uses it, I just heard. Um, I, what I heard here quite often is that uh, if, if it boots, it works. So <laughs> that's usually the test. <laughs> Uh, and usually for, for device drivers, this is probably right. Um, but, uh, yeah, which IDE do I use? Uh, pff, uh, depends on, yeah, maybe Emacs for bigger stuff, maybe just Nano or, uh, I think the, the IDE is not really so important for, for developing the code. Uh, and because, I don't know, uh, when I need a little bit of documentation, I look in the documentation folder or in fact, some, some, some cross references in the C code. There is a nice website, which I cannot remember right now, where you can look up where is a certain function declarated and jump to it. Ah, yeah. LXR dot free electrons. Okay. <laughs> I mean, of course, you can uh, contribute big patches. I wouldn't do this in the very beginning. It's very uh, because it's not so nice. But uh, of course, uh, I mean, if you uh, if you have a great patch and it really makes sense to include it and it fixes stuff or it uh, refactors stuff in a good way, then uh, it will be accepted. It's uh, that's not the problem. But uh, the more you touch, the more you break, can break, and uh, there you have to take care. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just always do one thing in one commit and uh, one thing in what patch and uh, don't mesh stuff, stuff together, right? Yes? Um, I mean, the Linux kernel is, uh, is released every roughly six weeks or something like that. Um, and uh, actually, I think it's quite fast. Uh, to be honest, I don't really, uh, I, I, can't, I can't tell you a timeline, but I think within a few weeks or months, it will be in the mainline kernel. Or, or do you have any, any, yeah, uh, would you agree? Uh, when, when it gets attacked, for example, in your network patch, it gets accepted by the kernel. It gets into the network tree, and during an attack merge window, which is the big uh, in the period where all the sub-maintainer things get merged and go forward, so it gets in there. Then, when this kernel is released, it's really exciting. So it shouldn't take really long. Maybe a few weeks, maybe a very few months. <laughs> But it should be be fast. 
anything else? I can also recommend uh, there are um, on YouTube there are a lot of uh, videos of uh, Greg Crow Hartman where he explain ex explains exactly how it works and even does uh, writes a patch uh, during the presentation and sends it out uh, and that you can nicely see how it really works. Uh, I would really recommend it if you uh, to to watch this video. Good. There was a. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.